father took me to my first air show when I was probably five or six years old. And ever since then, I've been absolutely amazed with aviation. So I could not wait to tell you this story about this amazing Black woman and her story. It was 1892. And in January 1892, Ellis Island, New York, flung open its doors and began to feverishly process immigrants coming from all over the world to pursue their dreams. About 1,200 miles away in a city called Atlanta, Atlanta, Texas, a man named George and Susan, his wife Susan Coleman, they were sharecroppers. They welcomed the 10th of their 13 children into this world, a little beautiful brown baby girl whom they named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a bright young lady. She went to school, finished her primary education. And unfortunately, not long after that, her father who had moved the whole family from Atlanta, Texas to Wachahatchee, Wash Texas, decided that he was fed up with trying to get ahead, trying to overcome the Jim Crow South and all that came along with it. And he was going to move back to Oklahoma. He could not convince Susan, uh, Elizabeth's mom, to move with him. So he unfortunately left the family. He was part Cherokee. So that means that Elizabeth was African-American and Native American as well. So he moved back to Oklahoma, which was then referred to as Indian country. Well, with the help of a small scholarship, Elizabeth went on to uh, attend Langston University, which was also in Oklahoma. Unfortunately, because of funding, she had to soon withdraw from her uh, college pursuits because she just didn't have the money to pay for college. So she came back home uh, and took jobs as a domestic and worked in the fields, um, helping her family, her mother, who was now responsible for supporting all of her siblings. Working as a domestic and sharecropping did not appeal to Elizabeth at all. And about 1915, when she was 23 years old, she decided she was leaving Texas and she was going to live with her brothers in Chicago. She had two other older brothers who lived in Chicago, Walter and John. When she left home, she told her mother, I want to make something of myself. When she arrived in Chicago, she decided she was going to go to a beauty cosmetology school and or cosmetology school and she went to learn how to become a manicurist. And so she finished her training and she started working in the African-American community in barbershops um, because almost every barbershop had a, a manicurist. And I don't know how much you know about barbershops in the African-American African community, but the barbershop is the community center. It is the hub of the community. At least it used to be. Nowadays we have boutique barbershops. We have barbershops that are a little different from what they were. Um, they cost more, they may have a little more aesthetics, but back when I was a little boy, even the barbershop was the center. If you wanted to know what was going on, if you want to have a conversation about current events, if you needed something that you couldn't find, there was a guy at the barbershop who knew everything, or at least he thought he did. So this is the environment where Bessie is working in the barbershop. She quickly became known as one of the best and fastest manicurists. Uh, in Chicago in the African-American community. So about uh, 1918, World War I ended and soldiers were coming back to America. Her brothers, Walter and John, both served in the war in France and they returned home safely. So she's in this barbershop environment working and she's hearing, she's starting to hear all of these war stories, these stories from the soldiers who are coming back home, talking about their adventures, talking about uh, you know, the conquest, uh, talking about the danger, and talking about airplanes, talking about these warplanes that were uh, darting and dodging all in the sky. Of all of the stories that she heard, the stories about airplanes intrigued her the most. She could not hear enough about them. She, she wanted to know all about them. And anytime anyone had a story about air, airplanes, she would almost be frozen just to hear about what, uh, what happened, uh, what was the story, what was it like? So she quickly became intrigued by 
flying. So one day she simply realized she wanted to learn how to fly. She expressed that to her brother who had served in the war. And he said, black women, you're never going to learn how to fly. You'll never get that opportunity. And Bessie said, she said to herself at the time, that was it, that did it. It was almost as if he dared her to learn. He dared her to try. It lit a fire in her. And I don't know if you know one, but I think we all know plenty of them. There is nothing like a woman on fire. Bessie started to apply to any flying school. She could find any flying school she could hear about. And she had two things working against her. She was a woman and she was black. Bessie applied to just about every flying school in America. They all turned her down. But she was a woman on fire by this point. And she had managed to make some powerful friends while she had been living in Chicago. She had met a man named Robert Abbott. Robert Abbott was the publisher of the Chicago Defender. It was one of the largest African-American papers in the area. And she had met a man named Jesse Binga. And Jesse Binga was a bank owner. And can I just say, uh, just take a second for a public service announcement. This is more for our youth and young adults. There is no, nothing wrong with being nice. There is nothing wrong with making associations. You never know who you're talking to. You never know how they can expand your network. You never know how they can help you. You never know how someone knows or has something that you're going to need down the road. Well, Bessie was probably just being nice. She had met these gentlemen and eventually they were able to help her to start to achieve her dream when she expressed her uh, discontent with the idea that she had applied to almost every flying school in America and had been turned down, Mr. Abbott said, who no doubt had international connections, he said, Bessie, you're going to have to probably go to Europe to learn how to fly. If you go to France, you can probably find a flying school that will receive you. And so this woman on fire she started to make her plan because there is nothing like a woman on fire. She first got a second job because she knew she needed to make as much money as she could. She needed to squirrel it away because she knew that she would have expenses. So she starts to work two jobs so that she can double her income. And then Bessie went to night school. She went to night school to learn French. She wanted to learn how to read, write, understand, and speak French. That's exactly what she did. She started to apply to French uh, flying schools, and in not long, she was accepted at one of the most well-known flying schools in France. So when the time was right, it was about 1920, she emptied her bank accounts. She settled all her affairs in Chicago and she boarded the SS impersonator bound for France to begin her training. Bessie's training took 10 months and she learned to fly, flying the Newport Type 82 biplane. So in the mid part of June, her training was complete. But if we can back up just a little bit and look at a very, very tense time in America, just by comparison, on June 15th, 18, excuse me, 1921, Bessie Coleman is receiving um, her pilot's license. She is the first African-American, not African-American woman, but the first African-American to receive an international pilot's license. But in America on June 1st of the same year, 1921, six pilots boarded six planes, flew over an American city, dropped bombs on that American city, and killed Americans. We call it the Tulsa riot, or it was actually the Tulsa, Tulsa massacre, when Black Wall Street was bombed, yes an American city with American citizens was bombed by American pilots in June of 1921, June 1st to be exact. 
14 days later on June 15th, Bessie Coleman is getting her pilot's wings in France, the first black person to receive an international pilot's license. That juxtaposition is horrific. While she is proving that African-Americans have the intelligence and education and everything that we need to be just as successful as anyone else, someone in America decided that these Black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who had formed a strong and very prosperous, prosperous community, did not deserve the community that they built, and they were bombed. Bessie's international pilot's license was number 18.310. Now, to be fair, in that same year, in October of 1921, Warren G. Harding, who was then the president of the United States, became the first sitting president to speak out against lynching. So at least that was something. But it's just interesting to know that while Bessie was learning to fly, those who already could fly were waging war on her people and on a community that had done no wrong. So Bessie sailed home on the SS Manchuria. And when she arrived back in the United States, she was the toast of the African-American community. Yes, she was. Now she was largely ignored by the white community. In fact, she got no press in any white paper at all, but she was celebrated and touted in the African-American community as she should have been. There was not a, not a lot of work um, in those days for a pilot of any color, except this thing called barnstorming. Barnstorming, that's what we would today call an air show. Well, Bessie knew that her skills weren't quite up to par to be a good barnstormer at the time. She had just you know, learned how to fly. But again, she was a woman on fire and there's nothing like a woman on fire. So what did she do? She went back to Europe to receive additional training so that she could perform the stunts and loops and everything that she saw these barnstorming pilots do. When she went back to Europe, again, she made powerful friends. She flew with some great pilots and aircraft designers, not the least of which was a man named Anthony Fulker. Anthony Fulker is one of the most uh, celebrated aircraft designers of his day. He designed the uh, Fulker biplane, which was one of the most deadly biplanes in World War I and shortly thereafter. His family uh, went on to design and build many aircrafts. She flew with uh, French aircraft pilots, uh, manufacturers and designers, uh, German, Dutch. In fact, she was one of the first people to fly over the Kaiser's palace. She had a, a photographer in the plane with her and he snapped a few photographs looking down on uh, the Kaiser in Germany, his palace. She got to know some very powerful people and she impressed them. She became a member of the Aerial Club of France, which is a very exclusive club to join. By the time she left Europe the second time, y'all, she had been written up and touted in almost every magazine and newspaper in Europe. She was respected by some of the uh, best pilots of the day. In fact, many of them declared her to be one of the best pilots that they had ever seen. When she returned to the United States the second time, it was a whole different ball game. Every paper covered it. Her return reception was much larger than the first. She had made a name for herself in Europe and it had followed her. It had in fact preceded her back to the United States. She had all the skills that she needed to be a great air show pilot. Her first show was at Curtis Field in New Jersey. Curtis, the Curtis company was an aircraft manufacturer. And of course they had their own airfield just like today if you go to Seattle and visit the Boeing plant, they have their own field and air and, and runway where they can test their planes. Her first air show was at the Curtis Field in New Jersey. And she went on to headline 
air shows all over the country, even down in the South. She had a disagreement with her manager who did not want her to go into the South for obvious reasons, but that's exactly where she wanted to go. And what she would do is um, she would have uh, the local uh, soldiers, uh, African-American soldiers who had served in the war, she would have them to parade out on the field. She wanted to give them the recognition that they deserved after serving in the war. Um, she wanted to give them the recognition that perhaps they didn't get upon their return from the war. She wanted to lift them up. Um, she had heard the stories when she was working in the barbershops of Chicago. Um, she knew of their bravery and of their sacrifice. And so every time she had an air show, she would gather together the soldiers who were in that area who had served, and she would allow them to start off the show. After they performed on the field and were recognized as the heroes that they were, she would take to the sky and she would dip and whirl and spin and loop. And she just enthralled the crowds. People, in fact, some couldn't believe that this black woman, and she was a short lady who was in command of this aircraft and was doing all of these wonderful things. Like her uh, friend, Josephine Baker, because they were friends. If you saw our uh, video about Josephine Baker, Josephine Baker and uh, uh, Bessie Coleman were friends. They knew each other. But like her friend, Josephine, she refused to perform in front of crowds that were segregated. Josephine Baker did the same thing. She would not perform at clubs and venues that were segregated. She refused that. She made sure before the show started that all of these things were to her liking. And because she was the headliner, she had, you know, quite a big stick to weld. She got nicknamed Brave Bessie, and they called her Queen Bess because that's um, the, the, uh, the, the courage that she displayed as she gave these wonderful air shows. And then when the air shows were over, she would take passengers up for ride-alongs. She charged $5 a passenger, which was pretty steep in those days. It was probably $40 or $50, comparatively speaking. Um, but the reason why is because she had in her mind a goal, a dream to start the first flying school in America for African-Americans. Again, she's a woman on fire and she had hit her stride and made good on her statement to her mother, I'm going to make something of myself. So about a year after she started barnstorming, she had an accident. She had a uh, crash uh, that she survived. Um, she came away with a broken leg and some broken ribs. So she took a little while to um, get back into um, uh, the shape where she could fly. She told the newspaper reporters to tell my public I will be back. But she didn't just spend that time sitting around. She used that time to continue to raise money for the flying school that she wanted to start. She wanted to start a flying school for African-Americans who wanted to learn how to fly like she did. So she would give lectures uh, along with um, films about you know, air shows that she had given, probably footage that she had brought back with her from Europe and France. And so she would do that while she was convalescing, while she was getting better. Probably in Chicago is where she would interact with Josephine Baker. Uh, they were friends. And a little known fact is that Josephine herself got her pilot's license also in France about 1933, I think it is. And so they had that in common. There were two African-American women who were giants and legends in their own time, and they were also pilots. So along with her giving lectures so that she could continue to raise money for her flying school, uh, uh, Bessie uh, began to get better and better and stronger so that she could get back onto the barnstorming circuit. So it wasn't long before she was physically fit and able to fly again. And she got back to doing what she absolutely loved to do, and that is to fly. She once said, you haven't lived until you have flown. That's how much she absolutely loved it. And of, of all of the air shows and barnstorming events that she did, and there were many, many were not even recorded. She said the two that stood out more for her than any others were when she was able to go back to Atlanta, Texas and perform over the home crowd and it and delight the crowds in the place where she grew up. And when she flew over Houston, Texas 
on Juneteenth. She said both of those were experiences of a lifetime. Now, by now, she had raised enough money. She had made enough money to, um, to submit the final payment for her own airplane. And from the Curtis Corporation, where she did her first air show in New Jersey, she purchased a Jenny. A Jenny is a little different from the plane that's behind me here. I think I have a picture of her on it, actually. I'm going to share it with you. She purchased a Curtis Jenny, and she had it ferried out or flown out from New Jersey to Florida, where she was at the time. Her aircraft mechanic actually went out and brought it back to her. So now it's in Jacksonville, Florida. She was preparing for an air show and she always did her homework. So it's the day before the air show. She's getting ready of uh, just checking out the airfield. Um, Bessie was a parachutist. And sometimes she would have someone else flying the plane. She would jump out the plane and perform um, a parachute landing. Again, just delighting the crowd. And so what she was doing with her mechanic is they were flying over the airfield and she was looking for the best place for to land because she planned to do a parachute jump that next day. Tragically, the plane had a malfunction. Her mechanic was flying. She was not strapped into her seat, probably because it was easier to look over the side of the plane if you're not strapped into the seat. And the plane uh, had a tragic malfunction. Her mechanic lost control of it and spiraled out of control. And she was not strapped into her seat. So Bessie was, in fact, ejected from the plane. Of course, the impact with the ground um, ended her life. Her mechanic, he also died as well because the plane went out of control and slammed into the ground. So she passed away, sadly, at the age of 34. But death had knocked at her door just a little too late, for she had already made good on the promise to make something of herself. And she had already inspired hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of people all around the world with what this young lady, this African-American black woman um, was told she couldn't do by being rejected by every flying school in America, yet going across the water like her friend, Josephine Baker, and, um, and achieving her goal. Now, Bessie was so popular by the time she died. She had not one, but several um, services, uh, several funeral services in different places. The two largest were in Orlando and in Chicago. She had the nickname uh, Brave Bessie or Queen Bess, and there were more than 10,000 mourners at her services. The first was in Orlando. The last one was in Chicago, and it was presided over by none other than Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells, that's another historical video for another time. Her final resting place is in Lincoln Cemetery in Blue Island, Illinois. And to this day, every year, the Flying uh, Society of Chicago, Illinois, and the surrounding areas, they perform a flyover of uh, Bessie Coleman's grave every year in commemoration of her life and her legacy. She was not able to be, begin to found the school for African-Americans um, while she was alive, but her legacy was able to do exactly that. And so uh, because of her life and her, and her legacy and all that she achieved, there are several uh, schools begun for African-Americans to learn how to fly. And some of them are st still teaching uh, people how to fly to this day. She left home, she left Wasahatchee, Texas. She told her mother, I'm gonna make something of myself. And I don't think there's any debate that she absolutely did that. Every aviator, every African-American aviator stands on her shoulders and we all owe her a debt of gratitude. We now have females serving in military combat aviation forces in every branch of the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard. Yeah, when I think of Dr. Mae Jemison, who's the first Black woman astronaut, the first African-American woman to fly into space. When I think of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kimbrell, when I think of Anissa Moore and so many others, 
they all stand on her shoulders. And can I just say about black women, a black woman, no matter what she's doing, she might be engaged in the most dangerous and risky profession there is. But even then, she's gonna look good doing it. As you can see from some of these photographs of these amazing black women who Bessie Coleman was a trailblazer for, and not just the women. You know, General uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., who was the commander of the Tuskegee Airmen, and all the Tuskegee Airmen, they all stand on her shoulders. When she said, I'm going to make something of myself, that's exactly what she did. Now, I'm a student of the school of thought that says most of the good things to say have already been said. And so I want to close out and leave you with this quote from one of our great keynote speaker. His name is Les Brown. He said, if you want something bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it. If you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose all of your terror of the opposition for it. If you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence and stern pertinacity, if neither cold, nor famine, nor poverty, nor gout, nor sickness, nor pain of body and brain can keep you away from that thing that you want. If dogs and grim you besiege and beset it, then with the help of God, I believe you will get it. She was known as Brave Bess. She was known as Queen Bess. I call her the original Queen Bee. And we thank Elizabeth Bessie Coleman for all that she did in pursuit of what she wanted to do and what she wanted to achieve in this world. And in doing that, she inspired us all to reach beyond even that which we believe we can achieve. And so we salute Elizabeth Bessie Coleman, the original Queen Bee, who has inspired us all and helped us to know that there is nothing that we cannot achieve if we make a plan and set our minds to it. Truth be told, my brothers and sisters, you can find our history anywhere because our history is everywhere. See you again soon, my friends. If you would like to receive more videos like this, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to receive our new releases. If you would like to assist, truth be told, in our mission to preserve African American history, which is American history, please share this video with your children, family, and friends. Truth be told, you can find Black history anywhere because our history is everywhere.